Good morning. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Round. Um, today's speaker will be Dr. Christine George, one of our third-year residents. Uh, Dr. George graduated from Virginia Polytechnic University with a degree in biological sciences, went on to do her medical training at George Washington University. Dr. George has extensive training in research as an analyst, technical writer, and as a project director, including projects in Mali that looked at mosquito-borne risk reduction. Uh, her interests include academic, global, um, infectious disease medicine, and health information technology. During her, her time at Carillon, she has been busy. Um, <laughs> she has represented the residents on the Infection Disease Control and the Family Advocacy Committee. She has co-written a chapter on meningitis with Dr. P in the Pediatric Emergency Medicine textbook. She was a member of Project Revise, a QI project that looked at sepsis evaluation, and she has co-written the curriculum for residents on transport medicine. Please welcome Dr. Christine George. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much, um, and good morning. So today we're going to be talking about um, pediatric telehealth and my title, Current Endeavors and Future Opportunities. And I have absolutely no disclosures whatsoever. <laughs> All right, just some, review some of the learning objectives for today. We're going to go through and make sure we have a good grasp on the difference between telehealth and telemedicine, talk about some of these key modalities that we utilize to deliver these types of services, talk about some of the challenges and future opportunities that we have um, in the field of telehealth, and then go over some of the projects that Berlin Clinic is doing um, in this field at present. All right, so telehealth. Telehealth is a very big, broad term. Um, and, you know, it's basically anything that enhances healthcare, public health, or health education, um, utilizing any type of telecommunication technology. And telemedicine is a subset of telehealth, meaning those specific services that are uh, provided um, to diagnose or treat patients or to consult with another provider to diagnose or treat patients. Now, of note, that does not include things like audio-only telephone or just plain electronic mail messages or facsimiles. Uh, there's a little bit more nuance to it. So for those who might know me, I also like history, and I also kind of like to know how did all of this stuff start, where did it start? So with our origins of telehealth, the very first um, true telehealth that was utilized was back in the American Civil War by the Union Army, um, using the telegraph to communicate casualty reports and coordinate patient transport. And then coming along in around uh, 1925, there uh, was a famous cover of the of Science and Innovation magazine um, that talked about this radio doctor who could, you know, provide care at a distance. Um, dubbing this, this device called the teledactyl, um, you know, basically where, you know, it's possible, again, to feel at a distance. And this, this, it's a very interesting, it's interesting because even though you can see with this uh, picture that was on the cover of that magazine, it seems a little bit, well, there's just some old-fashioned stuff in there. But the same, the concepts, though, are very similar, um, surprisingly similar to what we do today. Uh, with telemedicine. And then the, the first true uh, case where we saw this in um, medical literature is with teleradiology. Um, and this was in a study that was published in 1950 describing something that was uh, these uh, two physicians were able to do a couple years earlier, and they dubbed it telegnosis or this uh, utilizing telecommunications um, to provide diagnosis of a medical condition. And they use a very old school facsimile um, version in order to transmit uh, x-rays from one place to another. And since that time, it's just continued to grow and grow and grow. Telehealth is a huge business and it's also a huge um, market that 
is continuing to rise and has rise exponentially within the last decade, um, as you can see by this graph. Why is that? A couple reasons. Um, number one, again, we're talking specifically about with pediatrics. Pediatrics um, has formed a very regionalized um, health system, where you have a referral uh, pediatric hospital um, at the center, and outlying hospitals will then refer people to that hospital for subspecialty care. And I think that this uh, map really helps show you how stark that is. All of the, group, all of the orange areas are, is the radius where people live within a one-hour drive of a regionalized children's hospital. You can see we've got the you know, Roanoke area over there in Virginia. Um, but there's a lot that is not <laughs> in Orange. And so these are, this is a very, you're talking about long drives um, far away from sub subspecialty care for uh, a large portion of the U.S. population. And also, there are certain specialties in particular, um, like what we have here with pediatric neurology, where we're, there are just nationwide there's a shortage of pediatric neurologists. And, and that, so that's one of the specialties where there are precious few and we are trying to utilize them um, to test our ability and, and spread out their skills. Um, but also there's shortages are most prominent in developmental pediatrics as well and psychiatry. Genetics and child abuse are also uh, specialties that affect other, um, at other hospitals. So a study was done very recently, uh, published in pediatrics in, uh, about a month or so ago, and that did a big broad survey of various telehealth programs um, with, at pediatric institutions. And so went through and categorized what subspecialties are they utilizing telemedicine for, and you can see it pretty much does align with where those key shortages are with regards to developmental pediatrics, genetics, uh, psychiatry, neurology, but then also mixed in that are some other uh, key areas of emergency medicine, critical care, neonatology, and radiology. Now I'm just gonna go through a couple of these key telehealth modalities, and these are terms that any, no matter what article you read, you'll hear these terms over and over and over again, um, and so I wanna make sure everybody at least has these basics. So four key modalities, first being live synchronous video conferencing, then there's store and forward, which is considered asynchronous, uh, and we have remote patient monitoring and mobile health. So specifically for live synchronous video conferencing, that is this real-time interactive face-to-face -face encounter. Um, you know, and I think what most people think of when they think of telemedicine, uh, we have both a secure high definition video and audio connections between a provider and a patient or a provider and a provider. Oftentimes you are able to also then connect some digital peripheral devices to uh, the unit and in order to help replicate, help to replicate inpatient, uh, in-person care with stethoscopes, otoscopes, or other types of uh, cameras. Then we have store and forward or asynchronous kind of technology. And the difference with that is that it, there is a time delay, um, but you still have this secure electronic transmission of medical information, data, and images. And oftentimes, that tends to be from a primary care provider or a generalist to a specialist for uh, additional uh, consultation. And when you have this communication between two different providers, that's considered something that we would term an e-consult. One of the things that, that can be nice about this asynchronous technology, even though there is a little bit of a time delay, so for super urgent requests, obviously this is not a modality of choice, um, it can help maximize provider efficiency so that basically at the end of the day, that provider can go sit down and go through all of their e-consults uh, versus kind of constantly getting pulled away from other duties during the day. And there are also peripheral devices can be connected to these types of technologies as well in order to provide more clinically relevant data, whether that's a dermatoscope to look more specifically uh, at an area of the skin or uh, uh, utilizing uh, also attacking x-rays, EKGs, or other imaging. Then we also have remote patient monitoring. And this is something that's utilized much more in the 
managing for chronic illnesses, uh, more so in the adult population, but we do utilize this with children as well. And one good example of that is with type 1 diabetics that have continuous glucose monitors. And it doesn't have to be real-time uploading of that data, but every once in a while there'll be spurts where the patient's data is, is collected and then uploaded into a server that the provider is able to analyze uh, with them being at two completely different locations. And the devices that are utilized with remote patient monitoring, typically they tend to be FDA-approved medical devices that the physician prescribes. Last but not least, we have mobile health. And this one is much more broad and really fall, tends to fall more in the telehealth versus telemedicine umbrella. And it can be anything from just more general health education information, targeted text, getting information about disease outbreaks. However, they, they have started to bridge more and more into the remote uh, patient monitoring sector with our smartphones and how we're able to get very good information utilizing our cameras, microphones, and sensors and found this to be particularly useful in home care scenarios. And then of uh, particular interest to myself, uh, given my interest in medicine internationally, uh, there's a lot of utility for these types of applications in resource-limited settings. So going through, I'm going to go a quick review on some of the key telehealth technologies that are available and commonly used. First, I just want to do one quick definition. Uh, this is something that we talk about, but bandwidth can mean a lot of different things. Um, but in the particular telehealth and technology sector, we're talking about the rate of data transfer. And that really does vary based off of the application. And it is a big limitation of how big a telemedicine program or application you know, can be and whether or not it's a particular uh, type of technology can be utilized in a particular location. For example, in some rural populate, in some rural areas, the bandwidth is going to be smaller, um, and thus you might only be able to do asynchronous telehealth, with, which is basically equivalent to almost text messaging, um, versus in a city or increasingly, though, in more and more places around the U.S., broadband is spreading, and that, at that 600 uh, megabits per second, you can get pretty much all of these key modalities, including that high-definition video. All right, so one of the key things we tend to use for telehealth is telemedicine carts. And up front here, you can see we have this an example of one of the telehealth carts that we utilize here at Carillion Children's. This is utilized to do that live synchronous video conferencing where there is a high-definition camera on top of the unit and that the provider outside is able to then zoom in, zoom out, and get a really good view of the patient. They can watch a physical exam done by another provider for those things that are very obvious in that way. Or they can also, again, there's various hooks and things where you can put in peripheral devices, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And the other thing to add is with the telemedicine carts is they're turning more and more into basically robots um, that prowl the hospital. Uh, and which is, you can see one of those examples is, is, is in the middle of, with all of these other types of telemedicine carts, that they can be remotely driven around the hospital or an emergency department uh, to provide care. And then if you're wanting to downsize a little bit, you also have telemedicine <coughs> from in various ways, shapes, and forms um, that can also attach peripheral devices to them. The benefit for this is obviously it's much more portable, but the quality of the video is not going to be as good. You know, it's really amazing the amount of different peripheral devices that, that come up with um, that are digital, that we can hook into all of these different big uh, all just in computer systems and then transmit this data, you know, all the way around the world. Some of the things that are commonly used are digital telescopes, uh, sorry, telescopes, oh my goodness, digital stethoscopes. There's a lot of scopes in here, but there's not a telescope. Um, digital stethoscopes, otoscopes, ophthalmoscopes, dermatoscopes, et cetera, uh, that you can then take those images and then transmit them to providers. 
Another key aspect of thinking about technology with telehealth is ensuring integration with the electronic medical record that's at that institution. And so, for example, with the live synchronous video conferencing, this is just one example of one type of EMR uh, and that can be basically pulling, pulling up that patient in an account of an EMR and clicking a button and then, boom, you have a uh, conversation that you're able to have right there within that record. And that's becoming, that's become utilized more and more. <coughs> and the other way that we're seeing that this integrated is with that asynchronous modality of that, or that e-consult where there are either preset uh, text things for, for a uh, referring clinician to fill out, or literally it's just a blank, what is the question, and you can attach images, and that then gets electronically sent to the subspecialist to answer that question uh, in some set period of time. And it just helps to basically, they then, the subspecialist is then able to actually have access to the, the patient's medical record versus just over the telephone. If they don't have access to the medical record, they're taking everything just based off of your words. With regards to the type of technology, again, I just want to emphasize this really does depend on what, what your program, what's going to be good for your program. This is going to depend on what your goals are, what clinical services you want to provide, and how much you're going to have be able to invest within uh, that particular technology. And sustainability is a key thing to be considering when you're dealing with any of these hardware products, again, because you need to make sure that you have the ability to support uh, the back end of, of any of these technologies, to maintain that equipment, and then to update that technology over time. Because as we know, this stuff just keeps getting more and more cool and complex, but it also means, oh, got to get the next one and the next one, and making sure that you are able to keep up with the rapid growth. So now to some of the cool stuff with regards to all the things that telemedicine, telehealth are being utilized today, and this is specifically within pediatrics. So in the acute and inpatient care side, the live bedside encounters utilizing telemedicine. We see this in tele-ED or emergency department uh, models as well as teleneurology. So you, you can have anywhere from the, the primary care provider or a subspecialist come and with basically utilize one of the telemedicine carts, come up to the bedside and evaluate and then provide recommendations for treatment in the emergency department or inpatient ward. When you're dealing with a little bit more intensive uh, oversight or kind of continuous monitoring with a tele-ICU model where they're able to constantly kind of uh, monitor critically ill babies and children at community hospitals or even during an inter-facility transport uh, and then provide various recommendations uh, for real-time interventions uh, by a intensivist. There's also some interesting ways that you can utilize this, uh, this technology to help enhance the shared decision making. Pediatrics is known for being great about doing this family-centered care. We love our family-centered rounds. Uh, but there are times when it's just, especially with, like in the NICU, for example, where they're there for a long time, family is far away, but they still really want to be able to be involved in their child's care. So having the ability to just basically call them in for morning rounds every day so that they can stay updated uh, is another thing that we're seeing it utilized for more and more. Now for all your outpatient pediatricians. Uh, so utilizing it for remote consulting and monitoring. So you can do direct you know, patient video conferencing. And so we're seeing that with telehealth, uh, sorry, uh, telepsych, a lot of telos here, if you guys haven't noticed, um, telepsych telespeech, so doing speech therapy through utilizing telemedicine, and then we talked about that remote patient monitoring. And getting second opinions and subspecialty consultations. There's been a number of times where I've really, really wished I was able to get a nutritionist in the pediatric clinic to be able to just help reinforce and even provide some more specific recommendations right then and there while I have them here, and that's something that is utilized <laughs> at other institutions with even with a live uh, synchronous interactive model. And, but again, you can also do things with the asynchronous store and forward where you're doing e-consult 
and then teledermatology is a growing field in particular within the store and forward modality. Then we also have community-based care, so utilizing this in child care centers and in the schools or school health centers so that you have a nurse who knows how to utilize this technology. They have a stethoscope, an otoscope, an ophthalmoscope, uh, and they're able to even look easily in the, in the throat with the camera, and all of this information is then being sent in real time to a physician to help diagnose a condition or help monitor a condition. You can have uh, adapters to look at spirometry for your asthmatics, and if that's the only way that you know, you know, you know that they're going to be at school. And so there have been some studies even recently that have come out that have shown improvement in asthma care as a result of utilizing telehealth within a school-based system. And then applicable to everyone, so again, on the telehealth broader aspect of this teleeducation, um, or what we're doing even right now with this kind of distance education <coughs> broadcasting technology, and then being able to do bigger, broader uh, case conferencing, tumor boards, for example, and ways that we can help standardize evidence-based guidelines across multiple institutions. Okay. So next, that clock back there is not right. Okay, making sure. All right, so <laughs> telehealth, now we're gonna talk about some telehealth challenges and opportunities. And as you'll see, it's, it's, it's been a bumpy road and it continues to be a bumpy road within the sector. There's, there are a lot of really big barriers and challenges that we're, everybody's been trying to muddle through. And this graph is from the same study that I talked about at the beginning of this talk, looking at the pediatric telehealth landscape and surveyed again numerous programs across the country in terms of what were the key barriers affecting their programs, both at from a startup and then later on with expansion of those programs. Reimbursement by large is the biggest barrier that people constantly cite as an, an issue, but also there's issues with poor business model sustainability and just lack of time, lack of dedicated personnel for uh, specific, to be utilized specifically for telehealth, and a number of other issues which we'll talk about here in a bit. Now, so this is gonna vary state by state, and so everything that we're gonna be talking about here that is, that is state-based is just specific for Virginia, and cannot, you cannot take that and apply it outside of there because it does vary state to state. But within the Virginia Commonwealth, um, we actually do have pretty good coverage compared to some other states. In particular, so private payer, there we do have um, parity law where state law does require coverage of telemedicine services. Now, of course, that's always with this caveat of subject to contract terms and conditions, which is extraordinarily vague, and you can take that for as it is. However, that's more than some states have. Um, and the fact that they do require that the reimbursement actually be the same as an in-person service. Within Medicaid, it's, they have, uh, they, it is covered under, under Medicaid within Virginia, and it even extends to those managed care plans. However, there are a number of restrictions that I know uh, at Carillion that we've come across as, as little roadblocks here and there and can continue to be slightly challenging. One of those being, again, sometimes when you think of telehealth, you think, okay, they're, in, they're at their home, in their bed, and on their cell phone calling the doctor, okay? Now, with they are of Medicaid, that's not going to be reimbursed through Medicaid. Um, you would have to do a fee for service because there has to be a very specific site that the patient is at when they're receiving that service, such as a provider's office, education agency, rural health clinic. You can see the rest of these here, hospitals, nursing facilities. So basically at some type of health facility uh, within that state. Again, and then there are restrictions on those specific services that are covered and then on top of which types of providers at the distant site uh, that are interacting with these patients are eligible uh, to get reimbursement. <clears throat> there are a number of services covered with Virginia Medicaid. Uh, with the, on the live video side of things, all of your kind of 
just basic evaluation and management services in the office, um, outpatient visits, or even initial and subsequent hospital care. Speech therapy can be done at educa through education agencies, and they even have another, a separate uh, bullet point here for uh, cochlear implant function, and a number of psychiatric utilizations, including even the initial diagnostic interview and psychotherapy. Soaring forward, radiology is, was the first big one with uh, this type of technology and at, is continuing to grow, but we even have a couple extra things that several other states do not have, and that specifically is like obstetric ultrasounds, fetal uh, non-stress tests, and fetal echoes can be utilized in this store and forward way and be reimbursed. It also covers uh, diabetic retinopathy screenings, which is more important for our adult counterparts here, and then they do, it does cover outpatient teledermatology. And with the remote patient monitoring, Medicaid will cover continuous glucose monitoring in certain uh, situations, mainly the biggest one being for type 1 diabetics. A couple other caveats. Providers, you have to be licensed in Virginia. Our licensing system is state-based still, uh, and that can lead to some difficulties. And then on top of that, you need to be enrolled in that state med, uh, Medicaid program. There also, again, is some differences in terms of, so physicians can actually, if they are happen to just be on vacation in Colorado, they could still call into a, a patient who is in Virginia and do a telemedicine encounter, and that would be okay. However, if a nurse practitioner or speech therapist, or they act, that is not applicable. They actually have to be within Virginia. And for other reasons, uh, psychiatric, any psychiatric care provider also has to be in Virginia when that service is performed. So the biggest barrier, again, to looking at reimbursement is just the lack of literature, of really good quality literature to support tel uh, broadening telehealth within the community. And as, again, we, we have started to get that, but it's just, it is limited. One of the things that the American Academy of Pediatrics has done is develop, is put together this group, this sprout group supporting pediatric research on outcomes and utilization of telehealth. And again, they're the ones who put out the current pediatric telehealth landscape article that recently came out in pediatrics, and they're helping to facilitate further literature on this topic. Now, I'm just going to talk about two different, not to get into too much non-medical stuff, legal stuff, but there is a, a couple of federal compliance issues that I know that we've come across as potential barriers or just little roadblocks that we've had to work around. And one of them here is the Ryan, Ryan Height Act. And so this is uh, an act that was actually put out in the 1990s, and that was to help prevent online pharmacies from basically <coughs> prescribing controlled medications inappropriately. And this is when internet was really just starting, starting to, to fly. Uh, and so it requires that they have, a practitioner have at least one in-person medical evaluation before prescribing prescribing a controlled substance. Now, you'd say, okay, well, there is an exemption, quote unquote, for the practice of telemedicine, but honestly, it's very narrow, it's outdated, and most people, they can't utilize that particular language, and so there's a lot of stuff out there wanting for this, like, appeal for this language to be changed given today's environment. And there's also, when you're thinking about uh, fraud and abuse laws, there's, this, there's uh, one law called Stark Law, and something that's it's a little bit nuanced and, but makes sense, basically, that healthcare organizations, they can't provide certain services or give away certain services just to increase their own referral volume and get that kind of financial uh, benefit. So one big example within telehealth is they can't transfer ownership of certain telehealth equipment to other providers. Uh, at a free or discounted price. However, with all this legal stuff, it's, there's always exemptions and little things here and there. This, there are what they call safe harbor exemptions, so actual renting the equipment um, is okay. But you can see, like this is this is there's lots of little mind. This is a big minefield of stuff and can be very difficult to navigate. 
Other key things that uh, I know I personally have thought about when looking into this topic more, what about other issues with this fact that it's still not the same as an in-person exam? And how comfortable do you really feel putting your name and saying, yep, um, I agree with this diagnosis, I agree with this treatment, when I can't feel the lymph nodes myself or something like that. that, that those are def some of the definite limitations um, within telemedicine, at, at least at this point. But there are a number, again, of peripheral devices that can really, that are putting out some really high quality um, data to the receiving physician uh, that has been shown to be equivalent to an in-person exam on the studies that have been done thus far. There's some concerns about liability also as well, just because, again, you're like, I'm going to put my name on this. Is this okay? Uh, at, within Virginia, you are required, physician must get informed consent, um, and specifically talking about the limitations and alternatives to telehealth, and that's just being responsible. And then we're talking about state licensure laws. Uh, having, trying to go through this process right now of, you know, I'm about to be done with presenting and having to get licensed, it's, process is, is a bit of a pain um, with how it's very state to state and everything's so different, um, but something that the Federation of the State Medical Boards came up with in 2013 is this interstate medical licensure compact. And so this is a compact that the state legislature will go into with other states that will allow for basically expedited licensing um, and or just more interoperability in between where you, you can have easily obtained multiple licenses for, for those providers who need them. As of right now, 22 states are within this. You can see Virginia is gray. We are not one of those. Um, but I know my personal hope is that eventually that will spread so across the U.S. So a quick summary here of there's a lot of variations in funding, regulation, insurance coverage, health plans. Okay. But, you know, across the U.S., and as with most things, policy is behind the eight ball, but they are making progress. They are, doing, they are uh, getting better at this, and this is just going to be continuing to grow. And another thing of note is that, again, provider-specific services are actually tend to be the, the specific issues are the bigger barriers. Um, when implementing a telehealth program. Again, with this reimbursement, concerns about engagement and just the time to learn a new system to do, because right now people are often doing it in addition to their in-person stuff that they were already, you know, overworked uh, doing. So, again, not having that dedicated time for, for telehealth services. But still, there is a lot of potential and to increase quality and timely health care. All right, now for the good stuff here. Um, Trillion Clinic, what are, we do what are we doing with all of this? And some of this has been out of necessity, um, and some of this has been out just from innovation for, uh, local, for local providers. One of the key things that have been implemented is pediatric teleneurology, and in two different services. We have an EEG interpretation services service, which is asynchronous um, with specialty care, and that they read uh, those EEGs when our uh, pediatric, our wonderful pediatric neurologists uh, cannot uh, do that because they also need to go home and, and sleep and eat and all of those <laughs> great things. I'm looking at Dr. Wilson right now. Um, and, but there are limitations. They won't do NICU and no long-term or video EEGs. And again, with inpatient consults, it's been a big thing. I know this year is something that we've implemented on the floor, uh, the pediatric wards. Initially, we had one into it had been thought it would be in the PICU and NICU as well. But again, these are just things of starting off this program, you run into issues and we weren't quite ready for that yet. And leads me to a quick little blip um, by Dr. Goodkin from UVA, who we have our teleneurology. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Oh, but not mute it. But let's just hope it plays, because it did a minute ago. Oh, goody. Wrong with the practice. Oh, 
Yes. A, a pediatric neurology. He is, works with us uh, with our telemedicine um, uh, between UVA and Carilion. And he has been kind enough to join us uh, this afternoon since he will not be able to join us tomorrow morning and answer just a couple questions to help give the audience a better idea of what the current capabilities are um, and common workflow. So, Dr. Goodkin, um, can you just give us a brief review of the current inpatient pediatric teleneurology capabilities between UVA and Carilion? Yeah, so this started way back in October, and we are now providing services one time a month, uh, one week a month, um, of inpatient consultations for pediatric neurology. There's been a steep learning curve of figuring out how to do it on both ends, and uh, you know it doesn't work well uh, for children where uh, I need to be there and examine the child or provide ongoing, continuous, frequent consultations intermittently throughout the day. So um, while we began with uh, permitting ICU, both PICU and NICU uh, consultations, uh, we reduced it really down to uh, stable children uh, on the floor. And it's primarily been for those who've had first-time spells or, or seizures where it, it seems to work best. Um, and um, are there uh, any other issues or barriers, lessons learned, again, you know, dealing again with, with this whole process um, or anything else that you'd like to share with the group? Yeah, and as I just noted, the, the learning curve is, is been steep. Um, it's very uncomfortable for me as a neurologist not to be there doing my own exam and watching others do the exam and, and certainly not being able to look at the fundus uh, yeah. myself. Uh, it leads to a little bit of jitters on, on my side um, in making uh, decisions. Have, have you thought about um, incorporating peripherals into the uh, the telemedicine um, unit, such as one that could possibly uh, look at the fund of the do a, a retinal scan or something that. Yeah, well, I think that technology is certainly there. Uh, uh, you know, the, the one where it works best is the peripheral uh, stethoscope. Um, and, and I've heard that the sound quality on there is really, really excellent. So I, I think that's going to come with time. Um, you know, I, I, I think the reason you're doing this grand rounds is partially because uh, those of us who continue to, to work like we're a shopping center and don't figure out how to be Amazon are going to be the, the dinosaurs and, and not be able to, uh, you know, we're going to find shopping centers and the medicine going quickly away um, and, and need to figure out, especially with scarcity versus like child neurology, how do we provide excellent care um, throughout the state, not just at centers like UVA or um, and, and really began to expand our services and work together to provide that excellent care that together we both can get. Okay, so, so, you know, although um, we're not currently providing consults to the intensive care units, uh, I do think with time with better peripherals with somebody dedicated uh, to doing teleneurology being available, uh, not trying to do teleneurology on top of their already busy schedule, um, that, that those types of consults would be feasible um, and, and possible uh, in the future. Okay, okay, great. Yes. Well, thank you so much again for, for taking the time to speak with you. No worries. Oh, yeah. Stop that. <laughs> okay. All right, yeah, so he was kind of up to... Oh, you're right. Stop. No, I don't want to pay my debt down fast. Uh, well, that's not at this exact minute, okay. Um, you're talking to kind of... Pull us back down. <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right. Yeah, so, so that's what I thought was it was a great kind of summary of what we knew. And for those afterward, um, if you'd like to come and I can show you specifically, again, this, the, the unit up here is what we use for teleneurology. Um, and it, the camera is quite good. Uh, and it can show you some of the things that after, at, at the end of this round, grand round. All right, so other projects that we're working on that are currently in the implementing phase uh, is uh, utilize, uh, doing speech therapy. And as part of our uh, cochlear implant program. And that one actually can be and, and is home-based speech therapy, speech ther therapy by a live video. And it, this is at a time when it's very, very important for those children who are getting these cochlear implants to have 
really good follow-up so that kids can start to actually make sense of all these new noises that they're hearing. And something that is in the pipeline as well is uh, telehealth uh, within the pediatric development clinic and mainly having a satellite kind of site that where follow-up visits could be done by a live video and uh, in Martinsville. And this has also, again, been a learning curve where after review of, of kind of the, the legal side of things, initially we had wanted to do initial visits there, but uh, at least with how the Orion Height Act is currently written, it makes it very difficult to do that given the fact that most of the time these children are needing controlled substances, specifically stimulants for ADHD behaviors and autism. Some other things that are up and coming, which I will be greatly interested to hear about how this ends up working out, but our, for our pediatric hospitalists and intensivists, is basically setting up a secure live video in order to connect residents who are on overnight with the on-call attending who's at home when things go south. Uh, and, we, and we've all been there, but it can be very helpful to be able to have that video capability to say, this is what they are doing. How should I handle this while they're coming, working on getting in uh, to help the patient? We're also looking at this in terms of utilizing it for the neonatal pediatric transport team. So where they, the transport team would have a tablet or other device that they could carry along with them, and once they arrive at the outside facility, turn it on, and that, in, you, know, you know, they already have to call the provider and tell them, okay, this is what the patient looks like, um, this is what I'm thinking about doing, is that okay? But this way the provider can actually see this is what the patient looks like. They are, they are legitimately definitely in distress, not in distress, and then help triage from there. A wonderful pediatric home clinic um, that is something where they're looking into having a, doing a similar thing like what they're doing with development clinic also at a Martinsville location so that they can more easily do a follow-up within that community and also looking at pediatric infectious disease we recently had a visit um, from one of their uh, pediatric infectious disease uh, individuals and he was kind enough to have a good conversation with me about some of the, the services that we're looking at possibly uh, providing here when needed, whether that's a live video consultation or doing e that e-consult model. And just a couple other things that, from, that are either adults and kids or uh, mainly on the adult side, but I think still pertinent and interesting. We have the Regional Hospital Tele-Radiology Initiative. And I finally actually figured out what does this tax? And I always say push it to PAX, and I, that something magically happens, and it's, it somehow gets there, and it, they, you know, so it, it is an act, it, that stands for picture archiving and communication system, and that in and of itself truly is is a teleneurology initiative um, at its, its base, and honestly, one of the the first widely utilized technologies for that. Uh, also within the family medicine clinics, they've implemented. Uh, called my chart e visits, which for sometimes for more acute care type of visits, so that they can stay within basically their own medical home and have uh, get advice or follow up uh, about a specific concern. Then something that they're in the process of implementing uh, is telepsych at uh, family medicine clinic, and they have gone live at Rocky Mount and Whitfield. And, however, there has been some technology issues, and so there will be many, many more sites to come, but it's a little bit delayed because of needing to switch around the technology that they're utilizing. Um, and in addition, there's also psychotherapy, behavioral health uh, that's being, that will be deployed quite soon at a WISDO location. Maternal fetal medicine is in the process of collaborating with Dan Bill to set up a live video asynchronous connection in order to help provide their services out in that community. So if you want more information uh, and you're able to access our, the internal Carolian intranet, there is a telemedicine page that is set up by the telemedicine steering committee here. And under the departments and services, with, that, should be starting, that should be updated more and more as we continue to expand these services here at Carilion. And if you have a particular 
statistics you state that you think that the that Carillion would really uh, benefit from. There are instructions of how to submit that proposal or business plan to the steering committee, and how that works is you will it, it is a detailed form that you have to fill out to really again state, state your case, and but then the committee will review it, say yay or nay to a little bit more research, and then within. 30 days, the working group will come back with some preliminary research for the committee to review and either go through with implementation or say, I think that we need to rethink this a little bit. All right, so the last couple points here. This telehealth is not going away. It's just getting bigger and bigger. Um, it, again, the learning curve can be kind of steep here, as Dr. <laughs> Goodkin had said earlier. Uh, but there are many things that are continuing to drive this, which is why we need to embrace this sooner rather than later. So we have shortages in health professional workforce, current and projected. Current, very obvious thing, things like pediatric neurology, but there are uh, others um, depending on what uh, institution you're located at. We're having advances continuously in our electronic health records and decision support systems that are improving our efficiency um, and allowing for easier integration with telehealth. And then there's also where we're incentivizing service delivery at lower cost care settings, and that's being done in a public, in both the public and private sectors. So something like utilizing telehealth is a, is definitely one of those measures. And we are a consumer society. Um, people want convenient real-time access to healthcare services, and that's what they're wanting that more and more, and they're expecting it more and more to be in line with other aspects of their life. And Thus, there will continue to be innovations and continue to attract capital within that for product development. Close it. So, questions? <laughs> Interesting topic. I have a question sort of on two fronts. Um, one is really how the patients respond to interacting with the physician over a computer sort of device. I know me, at least prototypically, living in the old-fashioned world, um, you know, if, if I've got my kids sick in the hospital and, and they're going to see a doctor, what I envision in my mind is a physical man or woman coming in the room and examining them and doing the thing. Not so much a, um, a device, but I've not been down that road with my own family. Um, and second, how do they respond to it in the sense of they're paying the same health care dollar for a service provided by a machine device versus an in-person, like, person? And I realize that we don't see the bill from our hospitalization until three odd weeks after you go home. And they may not view those um, or think about it in that sense, but they're paying the same amount of money for person neurologist, uh, computer neurologist, and how patients have responded in your experience or the room's experience. Yeah, so that's a very, very good question. Uh, and so there have been some studies that have gone and started looking at, okay, what, what are the providers, what are patients, um, qualitative experiences with working with telehealth. In general, satisfaction has been good. Again, that is a, that is a, that is a big generalization because there are definitely some who are, say, gosh, I, I don't care. I, and I think I, Dr. Dieter had said uh, not too long ago to one of our other residents, I don't care. I would just I'd throw my, me and my baby in the car and we'd be driving um, to get to that in-person doctor because uh, that, that means a lot. Um, <laughs> He's laughing at me. Uh, but, but so, and I do think it's important to continue to look at that because that is one of the things that I don't feel like that we do have a, a really good grasp or enough data to say conclusively one way or another. The other thing is whether or not we are utilizing peripheral devices as much as we should. Again, the, te the technology is there. That is not the issue. It is all of the other stuff the administrative, legal, compliance, uh, funding, all of these things that end up are the really big issues. So I do think that we need to be cautious and careful with, again, I think that that's an appropriate question to ask. Is that okay? Because by making that mandate of them saying like that our, in Virginia, our private insurers are supposed to pay the same as an in-person service, that is with the assumption that it, it's, you are going to be able to do almost exactly, provide almost exactly the same level of, of care um, that you would if you were there because you're utilizing all these other devices that they know are out there. And so uh, 
I don't have an answer to that one in particular, but I think that it's something that they need to definitely need to be looking at uh, a little bit more closely and have that incorporated into those studies that are being done looking at feedback from patients. So that was a wonderful overview, and I'll just say a couple of things, because Dr. Ruban at UVA actually helped um, make it possible uh, for us to have this kind of law in the Commonwealth, and it's important because nobody would move forward unless they were able to be reimbursed, right? Mm -hmm. That was one of the biggest things there. But let me say that this started with stroke, okay? So if you're out living in Whitville, um, you're not going to be able to jump in that car and move up to UVA and get the stroke uh, evaluation that you need immediately. So you're, you're getting a service that you would never have been able to receive and probably you would have died without having received that kind of evaluation and the ability to, to actually um, have appropriate treatment given to you quickly. I'll say this. When I was a fellow, we first got a cell phone. Now, the cell phone didn't look like this. The cell phone was in a box that I carried around with me to picnics and everything else and had to call in like, I don't know, like Maxwell Smart, but with a really big box. Um, and we thought, this is amazing, but it's also clunky. I mean, I had to carry it everywhere. Um, I carry this, you carry this, everybody carries this. I speak to my granddaughter face to face and see what her development's like and see everything else on a day-to-day -day basis. This is not what it was like when it started out. What this is gonna look like in the future is that we're gonna be able to give care wherever a patient needs it, not just in one particular center and it's gonna increase our access. The ability to do this actually is quite, quite quick here even though it seems cumbersome. We started the teleneurology from, in, from idea to implementation in 30 days. And the way that we did that was by getting everybody around the table that needed to be their lawyers, the TSG people, the actual providers, uh, Epic Workflow. Um, when, when there is a real need, systems can move pretty effectively and efficiently to get it done. And they even have now digital gloves, which are like so awesome. Like you can put those on, and if you're worried about filling that lymph node, no worries, you're gonna feel it better than you did with your hand because it's actually gonna give you measurements. It's actually gonna give you different things that you could evaluate that you can't use with your senses. And I agree that being in person is, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a very good quality to that. But almost all of you interact with your friends on this as it stands right now. You have friends from all over the world, all over the United States in which you interact with and still have good interactions with. Our, communities these days, our young people, our young families are very used to using this as the way that they interact with almost everything in their world. Dr. Mulaney. I agree with uh, what Dr. Dunsmore just said. And uh, the question about throwing the baby in the car and driving, you know, as we've been looking at um, expanding our services for care of kids with asthma, we've looked at distances traveled, and we, we practice rural medicine here. And um, for instance, how long does it take to get to Withville? If I hop in the car from here and drive to Withville right now, it's an hour and a half. So if I'm coming from Withville with my three-year-old, that's uh, three hours in the car with a three-year-old. And uh, coming from Danville, that's, you know, even longer. And uh, what is the cost of fuel, being off from work, all these other factors that we kind of don't think about when we're sitting in our offices, you know, and there's a patient coming in every 20, 30 minutes, whatever that is. And um, I think uh, just informal discussions I've had with our patients when I've been thinking about this, and I say, you know, would you, uh, would you be open to a, a telemedicine visit in Danville? And it's like, when do we start? It's not, oh, I don't think I would like to do that. So I think there is, there's a lot to this. And, and, you know, if we can do telemedicine with folks who live one and a half to two hours away, it's not out of the question to be able to do it, you know, a couple oceans away. We, we did some testing with Google Glass a couple years ago and we didn't have the bandwidth, but we were looking at uh, Dr. Safford looking over the shoulder of general surgeons in Africa uh, operating on babies and just
thinking about the, uh, the the opportunities that we have to not only provide service, but also there, there are all kinds of research opportunities that we have as we build our telehealth uh, program here in pediatrics. I have um, a question and, and kind of one comment. I think, you know, my comment is I think your system would work because you have a cadre of patients that you know with established, and, and, you, and you probably would select among your patients for which are appropriate for telemedicine and which m might not be. My concern is always that our interfacing in person with people is important for finding things, I'm most notably thinking about child abuse, the kinds of things that people really come in specifically for, but we have to find anyway and, and, and how that having somebody else do the exam for you or um, even taking care of a critical care, critically ill child, but not being the one to feel the scalp, to feel that there's a skull fracture or those types of things, some things could be missed. But, um, but my question, and I don't know that you would know the answer to this, honestly, but is do we have any legal um, cases yet where someone's looking over the shoulder and there's a liability suit because the doctors disagree, the consultant who's watching feels that there was some sort of neglect or, or inappropriate treatment. And um, I, I just feel like this could always happen with a consultation, but is it more likely to happen in a situation where the con consultant is on your shoulder the whole time you're working on the patient? Does anybody have any experience with that? I, there are some. To be honest, there's a, so again, with liability being being definitely an issue that that people are looking at, and it's been surprisingly, I guess, the few cases thus far because it's put out, and it's been more or less aligning with actually more with, at least within pediatrics itself. Uh, if there the similar law, lawsuits for telephone triage cases um, where you didn't warn them about something or something like that, but. No, I have not seen something yet that has, where there has been a case put out unless anybody else has had heard of one. That's a good question. Remember, most of these were providing emergency, urgent care in stroke and things like what they were doing in California. So you would expect if there were really a lot of issues with that, it would have been shut down at the very initiation because these are very complex, high-risk patients who were being evaluated. Yeah. Now we do have people who could drive from ourselves. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, no, I can. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's always the issue with anything that we do as a physician, right? Um, or as a consultant. So being a consultant, um, usually, um, it, it that's always a concern. I get calls all the time, not only from people in the Commonwealth, but people across the United States and even in Europe, for me to consult on patients who I'm not ever going to touch, basically. Um, and even though it's by the phone, um, I still am responsible for the things that I say and do. And so you always have to use a caveat like, I cannot speak to this particular issue pertinent to this particular patient, but in a similar episode. It's the same thing that lawyers tell you all the time about how you do your consultations if you're going to take on liability. What if Sean then says, you messed that up, I watched you make the mistake, now there's an extra person in court, right? I was literally there watching, with, and it's recorded on Google Glass. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. There's no, there's no attorneys on the phone. <laughs> All right, you get the last question. Uh, I was just going to make a comment. My limited experience with the, um, the teleneurology uh, has been, from the face perspective, very, very positive. Um, because it's a convenience, and I do think that even though most of us are probably um, going to be uncomfortable with this um, at the beginning, that we should change our expectations and do what's best for our patients. Yep. Good. The option is no neurologist thing or this. So, yeah, thank you. All right. All right. Thank you so much, everybody.